uh, survey measurement of uh, probabilistic macroeconomic expectations. Uh, so uh, it's 20 minutes, so I got to decide how to use it. Um, whether you're a microeconomist or macroeconomist, uh, we all m model people's uh, expectations for the future as uh, probabilistic expectations. That's pretty much ubiquitous uh, through at least applied economics. Um, a distinction, of course, between microeconomists like myself and most macro people is that microeconomists uh, tend to think of people as heterogeneous and uh, many respects, uh, preferences, and expectations. And, and I think this, this particular, and I'm going to argue strongly that there are good reasons why macroeconomists should uh, think of expectations as being heterogeneous and sort of get away from representative agent type uh, formulations. Uh, there, there are two particular reasons why. One is that people may have different knowledge of the state of the economy, uh, different private information. But I think actually more important is people may have different beliefs about how the uh, economy functions. We may have different models in our head. Just like macroeconomists have different models in their head. And when Marty was talking about the kind of freshwater, saltwater thing with uh, Julio, uh, so there, are, there are people have different models of how the economy functions. And so we may have different expectations. Now, if you think that, and, and if expectations are so uh, critical to, uh, I mean, if you're going to model decision making under uncertainty, which we do all the time, you have to uh, think about expectations and expectations formation. It might seem natural to have some data on expectations. Uh, however, uh, that was ver quite, that was rare uh, uh, until about the 1990s, and I'm going to discuss how that's changed, at least for microeconomists. Uh, the, the reason, and I, I was taught this in graduate school, that, you know, that we're taught to be skeptical of subjective. Uh, statements of any kind, and uh, students are taught that a uh, good economist believes what people do, not what they say. I grew up with that, and through the first half of my career, I was a uh, kind of devoted follower of that. But then I realized um, that something was being lost, which is that if you don't have data on expectations, and if expectations are critical to uh, your modeling, then the only alternative is to make assumptions about expectations. And then you have to ask about the assumptions and where they come from and whether you believe them. And I became quite skeptical of the assumptions that were being made. So, so let me talk just a bit about that. Um, just to take one example, uh, income expectations. Uh, take the literature on precautionary savings, let's say, grew up during the 1980s. Um, you have to think about uh, people's uh, income expectations. You don't have any data on their income expectations, so you have to form models of income expectations. A very typical thing that began was to assume that people look at their past uh, income realizations, and then they use the past income realizations to forecast forward uh, what their income will be. But then the question is, well, how do they do that? And if you look at the different models, and I give citations in my paper to various models of the 80s and 90s, you go to the literature and people had different models, different stochastic processes uh, for income. So, so the w we didn't know, but we, we, just had, we just made assumptions. Now, for macroeconomists, of course, uh, you know, since the uh, 1970s, uh, rational expectations assumptions have loomed uh, very large. And um, I, from very early on, even, uh, uh, and I remember this back at CMU, you know, I, I had to be somewhat skeptical of rational. I, I understood the mathematical beauty of a rational expectations assumption, but I had to be skeptical of its uh, realism. And, uh, and I want to argue, you know, strongly, if, if, if macroeconomists or economists more generally don't have consensus on how the economy functions, then why should we ex expect that ordinary economic agents do? So that's that's a kind of uh, you know underlying argument. If you ask, well, why don't we have consensus? I'm an econometrician, so to me it's kind of obvious that we face inferential problems. My own work focuses on identification problems that get in the way of learning how the economy functions. And then, of course, there are mundane problems of uh, statistical imprecision. So, uh, so I have a lot of, I've long had a lot of trouble with rational expectations assumptions. Now, so given that, then you might think, well, then, uh, so this led me about 1990 or so to think, uh, well, maybe we should start uh, measuring expectations. And, and by the way, I was mostly reacting to the use of rational expectations in uh, micro uh, structural econometric modeling, not in macro analysis. So I said, well, let's get some data. Well, you go back and you say, well, there's a long history to this. Psychologists of a certain type uh, have elicited subjective probabilities for literally over a century. Uh, originally, first with uh, experts like weather forecasters, but then with students in the lab. 
Um, uh, among economists, the measurement of expectations, although not probabilistic measurement, really gets going around 1950 with the consumer confidence surveys, uh, first at Michigan and then the conference board and so on. Um, where the probabilistic measurement begins, and, and this is a paper that I, it, is really a very unappreciated paper, but really in, in retrospect I think a very important paper, was Tom Juster. Uh, at Michigan in the Journal of the American Statistical Association in 1966 who, uh, uh, who had been involved with the consumer confidence surveys in the 50s and he said this doesn't do it, let's measure these things like consumer buying intentions probabilistically. And I have to say for myself, even though I knew Tom Juster earlier on, I wasn't aware of his, own, his 1966 paper until the early 90s when I uh, began working on this and uh, that was uh, actually quite embarrassing. Well, since around that time, roughly around 1990-90, there's actually been an explosion of work, and I put here in, in bold by microeconomists, uh, to measure expectations uh, in probabilistic form. And uh, now there's a, a huge literature, and, and so that's what I want to talk about and its implications for, possible implications for macro work. So, um, it's going on. By now, there are uh, many surveys eliciting probabilistic expectations. Just very quickly, the kinds of topics that have drawn attention, uh, the risks that a person faces, like job loss, crime victimization, mortality, future personal income, including returns to schooling and pension income and so on, uh, future choices. We ask people to predict their future behavior. That's what Tom Juster originally did with buying uh, intentions and also I've done work of predicting, asking people to predict future voting choices and uh, some of them explicitly on macroeconomic events. So uh, there's a fair amount of work uh, listening expectations probabilistically of equity returns and inflation. Uh, the literature is by now big enough that there are multiple review articles. Uh, I wrote an early one, it was my Fisher Schultz lecture for the Econometric Society, so it's an econometric back in 2004 and then three others, Mike Hurd in annual review of, these, the other three in the annual review of economics. Mike focuses on work in the health and retirement study, if you're interested in that. Adeline Delavan focuses on work in developing countries, where well, you may think this is more difficult to uh, elicit probabilistic expectations, but uh, there's a large literature there. And then uh, Char Andy Charter and Trevino in uh, the annual review in 2014, very large literature that, uh, sorry, was um, uh, mostly uh, that, that was begun by Andy Charter in the early 2000s, now does this in uh, experimental economics in a lab context. So, so this is a very, very uh, big literature by now. And then in addition, this, this work that's separate, that actually started earlier, we have the, a survey of professional forecasters and some similar surveys in, the, uh, in Europe that have elicited probabilistic expectations for macro forecasters since the early 80s. So there's a lot of stuff. There's a list of some of the major surveys, you can just look at them. I don't have time to talk about them in general, but, the, but these, these are tens and tens of thousands of observations. I don't think they, uh, Marty and I often have discussions about what constitutes big data. I'm not sure this constitutes big data, but it's a lot of data, okay? It's, it's, it's many, many thousands of observations in, in uh, many circumstances. And then there are a lot of one-time surveys for particular research projects where just people do their own survey. Okay, so that's all background. Okay, now here's what's in this paper. It's a big paper. And obviously, I don't go through it, don't have time to go through it, so I'm, I'm just going to focus in the little time I have on a couple of issues, but just so you get a sense, and I'll go through this table of contents very quickly, just so you get a sense of what's out there. This is, I, I first describe what the modern microeconometric literature has been about. Early on, a lot of the concern was just can you do this? There was a lot of skepticism about whether you could measure these expectations and uh, get sensible answers. And uh, the answer was, yeah, it basically did work. Not 100%, but basically it worked. So there was a lot of stuff on that descriptive analysis. Then, of course, there was interest in, in the accuracy of uh, elicited expectations. Even if you don't want to assume rational expectations, but we do care how accurate expectations are in circumstances where you can uh, compare them with uh, realizations. So there was a lot of work on that. And then in terms of actually using the expectations data for uh, economic purposes, um, there's two streams of literature. One uses the expectations directly to predict choice behavior. You ask someone, what's the chance that you will do something? And then you use that as a prediction of what they do. Uh, the more prevalent type of work is to use the expectations as an input into structural econometric modeling to replace the uh, assumptions about expectations that are in structural micro models with uh, data. And then there's some work on analysis of expectations formation. And I'm going to actually, in this little time I have, I want to really focus on expectations formation because I think it's 
particularly uh, you know, important for macro purposes. Okay, then the paper goes on and talks about three topics uh, that I think are more particularly relevant to macro work. Uh, one is expectations of equity returns. I'll take a minute on that. Uh, one is inflation expectations. I won't talk about it all except to say that the major survey was begun at the New York Fed in 2013, survey of consumer expectations. Um, if you read what I write about it, it's, it's basically to show how careful they were in the design of this. And I'll just uh, emphasize this here. If you get into this business, you do not want to be sloppy about it. Paying attention to question wording, how people respond, and doing it right is very important. The psychologists are historically good at this. Economists are you know, a little bit sloppier, but some of us have uh, you know, taken this very seriously. And the New York Fed people, I think, are exemplary in their, uh, the way they designed their survey. So you can read about that, or they've published many papers that you can read directly. Um, there's the expectations of macroeconomic forecasters. I'll, I'll say just a bit about that, survey professional forecasters. Now, all of this stuff that I've just said is, uh, takes as a maintained assumption that people do have probabilistic expectations and they accurately reveal the probabilistic expectations when you uh, measure them. However, it's natural to ask whether that's the case. So, so there is a literature, this is not talking about section seven in the paper, that goes underneath and says, well, what do we really know about what's going on in here? And how are people really responding to these questions? There's work on rounding uh, that I've done and some other people have done. There's work on ambiguity. So that's, uh, you know, people having partial probabilistic uh, expectations, but not complete uh, subjective distributions in their heads. And then, uh, actually, the hardest thing that I don't really know how to deal with, uh, but I think it, it, it actually raises quite a challenge, is this work, uh, theoretical work, and I mean, Jonathan's done some of this, on uh, confounding beliefs and uh, preferences. That, that may be the basic conceptual distinction that we have long maintained uh, in expected utility theory, that there's expectations about a state of nature and that's there and then there's preferences over here and that these are separate entities that maybe that doesn't actually hold. So I, I'm not, I don't have any time to talk about that, but that's it's actually, it's actually quite a challenge. And then at the end, then I do want to talk about uh, expectations formation. Okay, so that's the gist of what's in the paper as a whole. Going on. Uh, equity returns, I'm just going to be very quick about this. Equity returns are uh, obviously uh, uh, expectations of them are thought to be a fundamental determinant of investment. Uh, you know, I have no formal background in finance, but I've read some of the literature. Early on in finance theory, the view was that expectations of uh, equity returns would be homogeneous. Or if they don't start off as homogeneous, that ex post they'll be homogeneous, you know, driven by Bayesian updating. And so if you go back to, as I read it, Sharp and Littner and uh, and pharma and so on, they basically say we don't have to worry about heterogeneity. There's a, there is a literature though that goes, a contrarian literature that goes actually back to Keynes and others in the 1930s and then through papers by Miller and uh, Harris and Revive and Meshar and so on in the 80s and 90s that say that heterogeneity in expectations returns is fundamental to understanding asset markets and then particularly you can't explain volume of, training, of trading without heterogeneity. So there's that. So then you say, well, you, then you'd want to have some data on uh, expectations. So Jeff Dominance and I, uh, we had our own survey of economic expectations, and we started a listening uh, expectations back in the late 90s, and then put these questions on the Michigan survey. Just very quickly, here's the kind of standard wording. This is the one from the Michigan question. Here's, the, here's what the script that was read over the telephone to people. You can read it through yourself. Basically, the question says, you know, if, if someone were to put $1,000 in a diversified mutual fund, what's the chance, probabili uh, probability, that it would be worth more than $1,000 nominally a year from now, okay? And then we also asked what's the chance it would be worth more than $1,100, $1,200, and you can fit a person-specific uh, distribution function. So that's the kind of work that we did. And the various descriptive findings. Um, don't have the time to go through it. What Jeff and I did, based in our more, most recent papers back in 2011, is we used the data to try to model expectations formation. And we, and we had longitudinal data so we could actually see revisions to expectations uh, over a six-month period. And uh, we uh, hypothesized and got some evidence that the population might be composed of a mixture of three types of people. One, one with a random walk model of, in their head, one with a kind of behavioral uh, economics model of persistence that whatever's happened in the recent past will continue, and one with the opposite behavioral economics uh, model of a mean reversion, that if the market's been going up, then people think it will going down. And that there seems to be 
you know, three different types of people forming expectations in three ways. I'm going to have no more time to talk about this, but I just want to say that as microeconomists, we stop there. If you're a macro person, I think you would, might take this as a starting point for maybe perhaps modeling the dynamics in equity markets. That if you see that there's going to be some unanticipated change, then um, what, uh, you know, what's going to happen if the population is composed of these three types of people? Okay, so 20 minutes isn't a long time, and I can see I don't have, I, I, I was ready for this, so I'm not going to talk about expectations of professional macroeconomic forecasters at all, because I really do want to have the, my time at the end. There's a couple of slides here to talk about expectations formation, because I think this is probably the, the bottom line for this, for some, at least for some of you here. Back in 2004, when I wrote my uh, earlier review article, um, I called for a uh, study of expectations formation. Um, there have been some micro studies of expectations formation some since then, but uh, not very many. And uh, there remains a critical need for sustained research on expectations formation. And I think it's even more important for macro work than for micro work. Um, on equity markets, I just gave the reason. Right? That, I mean, how are you going to understand the dynamics of equity markets without uh, understanding expectations formation? So that's one example I give others in the paper. Now here's the interesting thing. Um, I was a colleague of Bob Lucas, um, and well, I would see him over lunch. Um, I never actually read the 76 Lucas critique paper until uh, two or three months ago in preparation <laughs> for this. I mean, everybody knew about it, but I never actually read it. And so I sat down and I said, well, what did Bob actually say? And, uh, you know, and it's, it's quite a beautiful paper in some respects, and I disagree with it in, in others. It's, it's quite uh, beautiful in pointing out the importance of understanding expectations formation and, um, and in critiquing the lack of micro foundations in the existing uh, econometric models at the time. I, that's, that's just wonderful. But here's where I would part with, I would have thought, I never asked Bob about this, um, maybe, uh, is it, if you take expectations formation as so critical, then I would have thought perhaps he might have asked, well, why don't we get some data? But that's not what he did. Instead, he uh, uh, said very strongly that we should assume rational expectations. And of course, the uh, literature uh, went in that direction. And we know why. It's an analytically appealing uh, assumption. It en enables you to close your model in a, a very nice way. Um, however, I, you know, and this is where from talking with uh, Marty, I've learned some things. I, I, I recognize that the kind of, if there was a period of dogma of rational expectations uh, at that, in Carnegie Mellon in the 70s, there certainly was. And, uh, you know, and then maybe through the 80s and 90s, but it's, uh, it's loosened up. And I recognize that by now, in macro theory, there's lots of, uh, you know, models of, the, of all kinds that deviate from rational expectations. So that's good. So I looked at some of the recent stuff, and I, I just give uh, the ARE paper by Woodford, and this paper that Marty and uh, Burnside Rebello, and this uh, JEL paper. I've looked at a variety of these things. So there's a lot of macro theory out there. Um, Woodford raises a, what I think is a very important question. There's a proliferation of macro theory work that are deviations from rational expectations. They go in many, many diff different directions. You know, once you go away from that central model, there's many ways you can do it. And Woodford asks, well, how are we going to separate among these th to see what's really relevant? So Woodford actually uh, calls for empirical analysis. And I agree with that uh, fully. Um, however, so what I want to talk about is the nature of the empirical analysis that I think we uh, need to do. I, I don't know, you know, Woodford's a theorist, I, I don't know what he had in mind exactly. I assume it was revealed uh, preference type analysis. But um, I don't think that just doing revealed preference analysis is going to be uh, sufficient. Uh, we need the data on expectations as well. And, and, one, and, and here on this slide, I say, I'll say very strongly that when I look at the recent macro literature, even though there are deviations from rational expectations, the representative agent idea is still maintained in most of the literature that I've seen. And uh, of course, representative agents' ideas can simplify things quite a bit. But I think you really need to move away from that. I think the data is sufficiently strong that uh, you really want to be careful of the representative agent assumptions and worry about the robustness of your models to that. So uh, the idea then is, since Monty says I only have a minute, we should measure expectations. Particularly, what I uh, want to recommend is uh, measurement of revisions to expectations after information shocks. There are two different ways that it, that's been done in the micro literature. Neither one's perfect, but they're both useful. 
One is to do it in real time. You have longitudinal surveys. You uh, measure initial expectations and then revisions after something happens. Um, I give examples like before and after in the paper. Uh, before and after 9-11, the revisions of the expectations of members of the Survey of Professional Forecasters panel and uh, you know, things like that. The other thing, you can do it in a um, uh, survey. You can give people information and immediately elicit their revisions to expectations in the survey. Okay, but uh, and I'm gonna f I am going to finish here. I'll be minus one minute, maybe. Um, I don't think it's going to suffice. I, I think measuring revisions to expectations will help. But we, what we also need, and, and this has not been done in the micro literature today, but I think it's very important, is to understand how people obtain and assimilate uh, new information. And here, and I do not have anything constructive to say about this. It's just bugging me all the time. The standard way of modeling revisions to expectations is Bayesian. But to be a Bayesian, you have to have a well-defined sampling process that's uh, generating the data so you can form a likelihood function. And when I think about the kinds of data that people have from media reports and uh, talking to other people in this, I have a hard time for myself even thinking about how I might do Bayesian updating. I do updating in my head. I know I go from prior to posterior myself, but I can't figure out what likelihood function I'm using. I don't know how I do it. So. Uh, uh, so I think this is going to be a very uh, difficult question. How do people use information to update their experts?